Welcome to PA History To Go, a series of videos presented by the Pennsylvania Historical Museum Commission with funding from the Institute of Museum and Library Services. These short videos, filmed at locations along the Pennsylvania Trails of History, serve to introduce virtual visitors to our sites as we explore the varied stories that make up Pennsylvania's rich history. Watch them all to learn about the people, places, industries, and events that make Pennsylvania so special. is a very solid example of how the community can take pride in their heritage. Robert Coleman came over from Ireland as a 16-year-old kid, essentially. Very strong-willed, uh, very skilled in a, in a number of aspects, especially in a good head for business. And he essentially worked himself up to having his own furnace, which was nearby, and then he eventually bought this furnace, acquired five, six of the mining operations. That's really where the wealth was. So Robert Coleman was a very determined, very uh, successful man that built from basically nothing to an empire that, you know, uh, six or seven generations later was still, you know, taking advantage of the wealth that he was able to uh, build and acquire. So the uh, person that actually donated the furnace to the state was Margaret Buckingham. and She was a descendant of William Grisby and Margaret Freeman. She had to acquire various uh, rights and ownership from cousins, including a small portion that was owned by Bethlehem Steel at that time. So basically Margaret Buckingham put all this together, gave it to the state, plus she herself out of her own money did certain renovations to bring the property up to you know, good condition. Cornwall Iron Furnace was important to the area primarily uh, as a source of uh, work, but it was built here because the source of the ore right down below the furnace was the largest ore deposit east of the Mississippi that was ever found. It was very rich and abundant, uh, and there was limestone in the area, and there was a stream right by for power, lots of woods for the charcoal, all the ingredients that went into iron making. The combination of this furnace, the other furnaces that were built in the area after this, and the mining uh, operations provided employment, not just for uh, a lot of people, but you have in the records, you have children and grandchildren being employed. All the money in the area was basically a result of the iron making properties that the, the Colmans at one point you know, owned. The, the sense of local pride in our past is tremendous. Well, there's actually two deposits here at Cornwall. The first one that was developed beginning in 1737, and the larger of the two, uh, extended for about a mile distance beneath three hills, the Big Hill, Middle Hill, and Grassy Hill. The ore was up to several hundred feet thick, and it extended about 700 feet below the land surface. The second ore deposit uh, was about a half mile to the east of the main deposit, and that deposit was discovered in 1919, and it was 150 feet below the ground and extended to a depth of about 1,200 feet. So it was mined exclusively using underground mining techniques uh, because open pit mining would not have uh, worked. The surface mining here at Cornwall changed over time. Uh, initially, when the mining began back in the early 1700s, uh, the miners used hand tools, uh, picks, shovels, pry bars, because they found the ore right at the surface. Uh, so they were easily able to break it up and load it into wheelbarrows and then take those wheelbarrows and dump the ore into uh, mule dump carts to take it to the local furnaces. Well. As mining continued, those small trenches and pits that the miners were digging coalesced into much larger pits. And so you see uh, remnants of those pits here in Cornwall today, both on Big Hill and the large open pit beneath Middle Hill and Grassy Hill. 
So besides the 106 million tons or so of iron ore that was produced here in Cornwall, the ore also contained other valuable metals, including copper, silver, gold, and cobalt. This is a piece of ore from Cornwall. It was collected from the Big Hill location, and it's indicative of the kind of ore that the miners first extracted here at Cornwall. Now, in the middle 1800s, as mining continued, the demand for ore here at Cornwall increased. And uh, fortunately, at about the same time, locomotives became available so that they could use trains to haul the ore. And with both of those factors, uh, they needed many more miners uh, to mine the ore. There are many different types of employees that were used at Cornwall over its time period. During the 18th century, there were indentured servants. During the American Revolution, uh, there were German mercenaries that were captured, commonly called Hessians, uh, that worked here at the furnace. But also, there were enslaved Africans. If you look at our earliest records, slaves were used almost from the very beginning. And they did a, a variety of jobs. We know that many of them were woodcutters, uh, there were some that were fillers, but really the most famous of uh, the enslaved Africans here at Cornwall was a man by the name of Governor Dick. In 1796, Governor Dick tried to free himself, and because he was seen as a piece of property, there was a, an ad put into local newspaper to try to get him back to recover it. And this is how he's described. $20 reward. Ran away from Cornwall Furnace, Dolphin County. On Sunday, the 17th of April last, a Negro man called Dick, alias Governor Dick. He is an elderly man, bald-headed, about 5 feet 10 inches high, stout made, has a down look. He is by trade a rough carpenter. He values himself greatly on his dexterity in that occupation. Whoever secures the said Negro so that the owners may get him again shall receive the above reward and reasonable charges if brought home. Rudolph Kelker. In Cornwall's ledgers from the year 1776 to 1782, the following slaves show up as working at Cornwall Iron Furnace. Abraham. Anthony, Beck, Bob, Buck, Cato, Caesar, Charles, Dick. At the Cornwall Iron Furnace, visitors can see up close the technology and the equipment that was used to transform a raw material, a rock, iron ore, to a valuable commodity, cast iron. You can also, as you're walking through the furnace, uh, with your imagination, think about the conditions that the workers had to operate under to produce those high quality iron products back in the 1700s and 1800s. So the furnace building, the charcoal barn, and the connecting shed are 19th century structures that were specifically built for the purpose of supporting the operation of the furnace. The charging room is the large room on top of the stack that was used to feed the raw materials into the furnace. So the charcoal, the iron ore, and then the limestone. Uh, today in the charging room, we also have uh, charcoal buggies. We have some mule dump carts that were used to haul the iron ore from the local uh, mines to the Cornwall furnace. And we also have a large horse-drawn wagon that would have been used to transport the iron pigs and other cast iron products that were produced here at Cornwall Furnace. The raw materials that were fed into the furnace stack included charcoal as a fuel, which burned, iron ore, which was of course the source of the iron that was used in the cast iron, and then limestone, which was used to remove impurities that were present in the iron ore. Uh, the people who worked in the charging room were called carters because they carted the material from the stockpiles, either from the charcoal barn or from the ore uh, that was dumped at the furnace or uh, the limestone that was deposited in bins 
All those materials were fed into that small hole on the top of the furnace uh, where the material would either burn or melt to produce uh, the cast iron. The wheel room is where the machinery uh, was placed that actually forced the air into the furnace. To produce a high enough temperature in the furnace, the uh, air had to be injected into the furnace so that the temperatures would rise high enough and the iron ore and the limestone would melt and produce the high quality cast iron. Now when Robert Coleman took over the furnace, he replaced those bellows with uh, wooden blowing tubs and that provided for a more even flow of air being forced into the furnace. Those blowing tubs were powered by a, a large 24-foot uh, diameter wooden wheel uh, that turned and as it turned, it moved pistons up and down in the blowing tubs and forced the air through an iron pipe into the furnace. Casting room is the money maker of the operation. So about twice a day, the founder, the person who was in charge of the operation of the furnace would decide when to tap the furnace. Uh, th th that tapping process would release the uh, liquid uh, hot iron, which would either be ladled into casting flasks or allowed to flow down a trough in the sand to fill smaller troughs where the iron pigs were produced. The furnace would operate for extended periods. Uh, once the furnace was at a uh, temperature, uh, you would want to operate that furnace as long as you could because as long as the furnace was operating, the furnace was producing money uh, by producing the cast iron. So typically uh, a, a blast period might last for several months. Uh, I think the longest that we've found on record is in excess of 11 months. Once the furnace shut down for whatever reason, then they would take advantage of that downtime to go into the furnace and maintain it so that next time they resume operations, the furnace would be ready to go. Cornwall Iron Furnace today is one of the best preserved cold blast charcoal furnaces. So if one wants to uh, see the technology that was available back in the day, this is a perfect place to come to see uh, the furnace technology.